So I'm, I'm very, very, very excited about that. So um, I want to share with you the most important message that I could share. And let me clarify just a little bit. First of all, it's not the most important message. It's just the most important message that I could share. And it's the most important message that I can share with believers. Because obviously the most important message is Jesus Christ. But most of you know Jesus and walk with Jesus. And if you don't, then we're going to give you an opportunity to get to know Jesus at the end of the service. But for believers, this message has changed my life more than any message. Uh, this truth has changed my life. It's become a message now that I share with people, but it's changed my life more than any truth that I've ever read in Scripture is this message right here. And all of the other messages, uh, you know, uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit, walking with the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit, witnessing, evangelism, missions, they all fall under this. Because if you get this principle, it's a principle in Scripture, if you don't get this right, you don't get anything right. So that's how important it is. So it's called the principle of first. And it is, is a principle that runs all through Scripture. Another way to say this is, if God is first in your life, everything will line up. Marriage, family, relationships, job, health, finances. Doesn't mean we won't have difficulties because we live in a fallen world. I understand that. But everything will come into alignment. But if God is not first, nothing will come into alignment. And so what I want to do is I want to show you this in the Old Testament in a principle, all right? And we will talk about finances some because... Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, it might not be there now, but it will be. So a lot of people think that your treasure follows your heart, but actually your heart follows your treasure. If you would like for your heart to be more in your marriage, you put your treasure there. If you'd like for your heart to be more in the kingdom, you put your treasure there. And this is, again, let me just say it because pastors misquote this. They say where your heart is, that's where your treasure will be. Not what Jesus said. Jesus said wherever you put your treasure, that's where your heart's going to be. So let's start with the Exodus chapter 13. We're gonna look at an Old Testament principle that applies all through scripture. And there are many New Testament scriptures on this as well. Exodus 13, verse one. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, consecrate. Now that's a big Bible word, which means set aside. Set aside. Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel both of man and beast, watch these three words, it is mine. It belongs to me. The firstborn belongs to me. Now, uh, in the Greek, which New Testament was written in Koine Greek, Old Testament in Hebrew, um, there's no way I could explain to you how emphatic this tense is. The, the possessional intent of this that he's saying when he says the firstborn is mine. It belongs to me. So this is very, very important to understand that the firstborn, and let me say another way, the first belongs to God. All right? So then verse 12, that you shall set apart. That's what I told you what the word consecrate means. Set apart to the Lord all that open the womb. That is, every firstborn that comes from an animal which you have, the males shall be the Lord's. Again, this is possessive, shall belong to God. 
But every firstborn, now this sounds a little Old Testament-y, but just stay with me and I'll explain it. But every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. Every firstborn of a donkey you shall buy it back, redeem it with a lamb. And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. In other words, if you don't return it to God, you're actually going to lose it anyway. Because it belongs to God. He calls it in Joshua 7, stealing. And all the firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem or buy back from God because they belong to God. All right, so I have three points, okay? If you're taking notes, I want you to write these down. If you're not taking notes, I want you to write these down, okay? So here's point one. The firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. Now, that's what we just read, and I'll explain it to us, okay? The firstborn, this is what we, we just read this, must be sacrificed or redeemed. Now, again, let me remind you, we're reading in the Old Testament, but 1 Corinthians 10 says that everything in the Old Testament is an example to us. So, we're going to see what this is an example of, all right? The, the firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed, okay? But how do you know which to do? How do you know whether to sacrifice it or redeem it? Well, he gives us two animals that are exemplary of um, clean or unclean animals. A donkey is considered an unclean animal. A, a lamb is considered a clean animal. So here's what he says. If your unclean animal has a firstborn, you have to buy it back, you have to redeem it with the sacrifice of a clean animal. If your clean animal has a firstborn, then you have to sacrifice it to God. So let me say it one more time. Again, I know that on this part right here, some of you could kind of say, okay, get to the good part. I'm, I'm going to check out just a little bit, check my email. Don't do that, okay, all right? Clean animals had to be sacrificed to God. Unclean animals had to be redeemed with the sacrifice of a clean animal. 1 Corinthians 10 says all this represents something thus. So what would this represent? Okay, let's just think for a moment. Spiritually speaking, were you and I, spiritually speaking, were you and I born clean or unclean? Unclean, right. Because we were born with a sin nature, right? I mean, all, all I have to do is ask the experts here, the parents, did you have to teach your children to be bad? Or did it come naturally for them? See, we are all born, according to Romans 5, with a sin nature. We, we have to teach our children to share. Share, right? Okay, so we were all born unclean. Now, let me go back just for a moment because you've got to catch this. If an animal is born unclean, it has to be redeemed with the sacrifice of a clean. Okay, so one more time, were you and I born clean or unclean? Unclean, okay. Was Jesus born unclean or clean? Okay, listen to me, the clean had to be sacrificed so that the unclean could be redeemed. That's how important what you just read is. Jesus is called the firstborn among the living, the firstborn. So the firstborn clean had to be sacrificed 
so that we become now the firstborn when we become children of God so we could be redeemed. It, it is so clear in Scripture. The, the, the first redeems the rest. Like Jesus said, when your sheep has ten lambs, give me the first one. Now what you need to understand is, first of all, God doesn't need sheep. He actually doesn't even, even need your money. He, 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 he paves his streets with gold, okay? He's okay. He can pay the light bill in heaven. And actually, Jesus is the light. There's no need for the sun, okay? So, it's, he, he's okay financially. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but why did God create giving? Because God created it, no preacher created it. And even if you talk about tithing, why did God create tithing? No preacher created it. This was in the Bible before a preacher ever preached it. God's the one that implemented Why did he do it? He did not do it for his sake. He did it for your sake. You see, because it takes faith to give the first one to God. It doesn't take faith to give the tenth one to God. So when, when God said, when your sheep... Has, ten, has, has a lamb, the first one you give to me, and the rest are redeemed. But it takes faith to give the first one because you, have, you don't even have the rest yet. It doesn't take faith to give the tenth one. Uh, it, it's like God doesn't say, okay, when, when you have some lambs, you can, once you have ten, give me one of them and you can give me the one that you don't like that keeps getting in your garden. He says, give me the first one and I'll bless the rest. This is exactly what tithing is. Tithing, what most people don't get is first of all, it is 10%. The word tithe means 10%. I don't know why God chose 10%. I know 10 is the number of testing in the Bible. And I know that God says, you can test me and see if I'll be faithful. It's the only place in the Bible where God says you can test him is with tithing. It's the only place. But he also tests you. Because every time you get paid, you take a test. And that is whom are you going to thank for your income? And some of you thank Visa. Some of you think the mortgage company. Can I just let you know something, though? The mortgage company does not have the power to bless your finances. But God does. So this, again, Scripture, it's all, it's, it's all through Scripture. Let me just give you one example. When they went into the promised land, God said, bring all, all of the silver and gold from Jericho into the house of the Lord. And remember, Achan didn't do it. They lost the second battle. Okay. And he said, you've stolen from me. Okay. But here's the point. Why did he say bring all, all, not 10%, all from Jericho into the house of God? Very simple. Because Jericho was the first city. <laughs> Are y'all catching this? Okay. He said, you give me the first and the rest are blessed. It's, it's all through Scripture. Uh, when my, my, you saw my son-in-law and my daughter there. When my son-in-law and daughter were dating, they met at our young adults group. And they began to date. My son-in-law at that time wanted to date my daughter, you know. And uh, so he came over to my home and, and asked permission to date my daughter. And I did the normal things. I asked him a few questions, uh, made him take a blood test. Um, you know, showed him my gun collection. Normal, normal things that a father would do, okay? Just normal, okay? Um, but anyway, th once they began dating, they were standing like at the front after the young adult service in the sanctuary. And they were standing with, let's, let's say, seven or eight other young adults. And they started joking with my future son-in-law what is it like to date the pastor's daughter? And then they started joking with my daughter. And they said to my daughter, you know, your dad is so strong on tithing, 
I'll bet he even checks the tithing records of the guys who want to date you. <laughs> and my daughter said, he does. <laughs> and I did. And I'm going to say something, and I know we're new to each other, so please don't get upset at me or mad at me for this. It's, it's very strong. But why would I give my daughter to a thief? Why would I give my daughter to someone that would not only steal, but would steal from God? And those aren't my words, those are the Bible's words. God says, you've stolen from me. They said, in what way have you stolen? Have we stolen from you? He said, in tithes and offerings, because they belong to me. All right, so the firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. Here's the second point. The first fruits must be offered. So again, we're talking about the principle of first. So we got firstborn and first fruits. Again, representative of Jesus. Jesus is called the firstborn among many brethren, and he's called the first fruits. Okay, so the first fruits must be offered. Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. Honor the Lord with your possessions. That could not be any clearer. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. Now, I don't know if y'all know this, but I studied Hebrew. Do you know what the word all in Hebrew means? All, yeah, okay, all right. <clears throat> So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. By the way, this is hundreds of years after the law when this was written. And I'm going to show you in a moment, tithing hundreds of years before the law. It's amazing because people say, well, that's under the law and we're not under the law, we're under grace. Well, thou shalt not commit adultery is under the law too. Thou shalt not murder is under the law too. Just because it was bad under the law doesn't mean it's good now. And just because it was good under the law doesn't mean it's bad now. Okay? So the law, by the way, God gave the law for two purposes. It's very easy to read this, very simple. This is Theology 101. Number one, to show us the moral absolutes of God. Paul said, I wouldn't have known not to covet if the law hadn't said don't covet. I wouldn't have even known. So it shows us the moral absolutes of God. But the second reason, according to Galatians, is it was to frustrate us to bring us to Christ. Literally, you, you read Exodus and Leviticus, and if you don't get frustrated, <laughs> something's wrong with you. <laughs> Leviticus has a whole chapter on what you have to do if you get a scab. <laughs> this is in the Bible. I could just see the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's just say, let's say they have to wait seven days. No, put 14. They'll never do 14. <laughs> and they wanted us to come to him and say, I can't do this. And then they could say, that's fine. Our Jesus already did it. He already did it. Proverbs 23, verse 19. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. Now that's about as clear as it can be. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord. Now, I just want you to notice the word bring. God never uses the word giving when he talks about tithing. He always uses the word bring. Here's the reason. You can't give what doesn't belong to you. You can only bring it. Or, according to the Bible, you can steal it. Those are the only two choices you have with the tithe. You can bring it to the house of the Lord or you can keep it in your account and steal it. And the Bible tells us that when you bring it, it's blessed, and when you keep it in your account, it's cursed. Yeah. I have no clue why you would want your checking account cursed. But when you have something stolen, it brings a curse on your house. 
okay? So um, uh, when I uh, um, went to seminary, uh, this um, student asked this professor, why did God accept Abel's offering, but he didn't accept Cain's? Now, by the way, this is 2,500 years before the law. 2,500 years for, before the law. And the professor, I thought, had a great answer. He said, I don't know. And I'd never heard a professor say he didn't know before. I'd heard him talk for 10 minutes and not say anything. But he, he said, I don't know. I don't have a revelation on that. Then, as I studied the firstborn and the first fruits, that's what we're talking about, firstborn and first fruits right now, it's simple. It's, it's just right there. It's, it's the principle of tithing or putting God first. Let, let, let me just read it to you. You'll see it. You'll see it. It's so, it's so simple. Genesis 4 verse 3 says, and in the process of time, now that's very important. In the process of time, it came to pass, it just sort of happened over time, that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord respected or received, is what this word means in Hebrew, Abel and his offering, but he did not respect or receive Cain and his offering. Well, it's just simple. Abel was a rancher, and he brought the firstborn. Cain was a farmer, and he didn't bring first fruits. He just brought an offering in the process of time. Did, did y'all see that? That's pretty simple. And God said, no, I can't accept that. Now, let me explain something to you. It's not that God wouldn't accept it. You need to understand this. It's that God couldn't accept it. And let me explain some theology to you in hopefully a kind of a, a little bit of a, a funny way, okay? Uh, there are some things that God can't do. Now, I know people think uh, God can do anything he's God. Well, it's not true. God can never act outside of his nature. In other words, God can't lie because he is truth. You, you understand what I'm saying? He can't lie. He is truth. I am the way the truth and the life. Okay, all right. So let me tell you something else God can't do. God can't change. This is called the immutability of God. Again, what I'm telling you right now is theology 101. These are the basics about God. God can't change. Okay. Uh, the reason that he can't change is because he's perfect. And if he could change, he could get better, and he can't get better because he's best. He's already perfect, so he can't change. Are y'all following me? Okay, let me give you another one that's kind of, this is a brain twi uh, twister, okay? But God can't think the way we think. Okay, stay with me. God can't think the way we think. Here's the reason why. It's called the omniscience of God. Omni means all. Sci uh, science means knowledge. So God has all knowledge. He knows everything. Okay? The, the reason God can't think the way we think is because we think to try to figure things out. That's why you think. You think to try to figure something out. Okay? God is not trying to figure anything out. God knows everything at the same time. And by the way, if you just think about that some this week, you'll, you'll trip a breaker. You'll blow a fuse. You just, you just won't be able to. You just can't. Im God knows everything at the same time. Let me say it to you another way. Nothing has ever occurred to God. God has never, ever said, you know what I just thought of? <laughs> I just thought of something I've never thought of before. Because he knows everything at the same time. Everybody got this? 
Okay, so God can't change. That's the immutability of God. God can't think the way we think. Oh, and by the way, let me just, in case you thought of a scripture and you thought, oh, wait, I, I know a scripture about God's thoughts. I didn't say he couldn't think. I said he couldn't think the way we think. And the scripture you're thinking of proves it. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. As the heavens are above the earth, my thoughts are above your thoughts. I don't think like you do. Okay, so he thinks, he just doesn't think like we think. Okay, all right. But just one other thing that God can't do, God can never be second. He just can't. This is called the preeminence of God. Again, theology 101. God, God can't think the way we think. God can't be, uh, can't, uh, can't, he can't lie, he is true. God can't change, he's perfect. But God can't be second. He can't. He's first. Preeminence means he's first of all, he's before all, he's above all. He's first. Uh, sometimes we as preachers will say, put God first in your life. Well, that's a good, good saying. It really is. Put God first in your life because you have a will and you can decide who's first in your life. But let me just explain something to you. If God's not first in your life, he's still first. You, you didn't change the order of the cosmos. God's first. So when Abel brought an offering that was first, God could accept it. When Cain brought an offering that wasn't first, God said, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't accept that. Because I can only accept the first. Do you know, I think there are people who tithe their quote unquote give 10% who don't tithe <laughs> because they pay their bills first and if they have enough left over to give to God then they tithe that's not tithing God must be first and that's the third point the tithe must be first the tithe must be first. Leviticus 27.30, and all the tithe of the land. Remember the word all means all. Whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, here's this possessive term again in Hebrew, is the Lord's. It belongs to God. It is holy, again, a, a big word for set apart to the Lord. Okay. So I'm going to give you an example of how this works, but let me just give you a little bit of my, my biological background, okay? My father is a mathematical genius, certified. He's a certified mathematical genius. My son that you saw that is my successor is a certified mathematical genius. My son, when he was in college, taking calculus, would call my father, his grandfather, on the phone, and they would do calculaic uh, equations over the phone. Let me say it another way, calculus over the phone. Okay. Now, um, apparently, it skips a generation. But I do, I have this math in mathematical mind that numbers add up in my mind without me trying to think, without me adding them up. It just happens. So Debbie and I were buying something a while back and it was $7.99. And the lady said, I'm going to have to figure the tax uh, on the calculator because the cash register is broken. And I said, it's 66 cents. Just like that. that, that quickly. She said, I'm going to figure the tax because the, the cash register is broken off. You use the calculator. I said, it's 66 cents. And so she looked at me for a moment, and then she went, <laughs> it's 66 cents. <laughs> and so when we got in the car, now you have to remember this was years ago. Uh, and the reason I want to do that is I want to give you a disclaimer that I was young and stupid. And so I said something to my wife that I shouldn't have said, okay? But we got out to the car and my wife said, 
how do you do that? Now, I thought that she was actually asking me how I did it. I found out later she couldn't care less how I do it. She was just kind of complimenting her man, you know. But so I said to her, well, sugar, our tax rate's 8.25, 7.99 is close to 8, 8 times 8 is 64, a quarter of 8 is 2, 64 plus 2 is 66. I said that should happen in less than a second in your mind. She said, it doesn't. <laughs> and then she said, but I know what 25% off means. <laughs> and, and, and so I thought she, we were still talking math. You know, when you're young and stupid, you don't know. You're not, you're not talking math at all, you know. You know. And so I, I, said, I said, okay, if something's $100, this is easy, math, you know. If something's $100 and it's 25% off, what does that mean? She said it means it's a good deal. <laughs> and then she said to me, and if it's 50% off, it's free. <laughs> I said, you're going to have to help me with that one. And she goes like this. Like I'm the one that doesn't understand math now, you know. And she said, Robert, everybody knows, everybody knows. If it's 50% off, it's the same thing as buy one, get one free. So if it's 50% off, it's free. And then she said, and if it's 75% off, you're actually making money. Which explains some reasons that our checkbook hasn't added up over the years. But. It's okay. All right. So, and she has lots of strengths that I don't have, but math is just, it just happens to me. So let me give you a math illustration that's not difficult and it won't last long for those of you that would like to tune out right now and have bad memories of math. Okay. All right. So let's just say that you're in the landscape business. I'm going to say, how do you figure out what the tithe is? Okay. Um, and how do you figure out that the tithe is first? So let's say you're in the landscape business and you come over to my home and I want some trees and some plants and some shrubs and things. And so you say, um, I say, well, how much will the bill be? And you say, well, it'll be so X amount in materials and it'll be X amount in labor. And then my fee, my, my, my profit will be $1,000. And this, this will be the whole price, but my profit's $1,000. Here's the reason. You tithe on your increase, your profit, not all this, because that's not profit to you. So you tithe on just your increase. That's what the Bible says. Okay. So, um, so let's just say at the end of the deal, I pay for all your materials, I pay for all your labors, and then I give you 10 $100 bills. So you have 10 $100 bills in your hand. Okay. Which, well, first of all, let me ask this. You have t t uh, please, some of you, this will be tough. Don't worry about it. You're better in other subjects, all right? But you have $1,000 in your hand. The tithe is 10%. You have 10 $100 bills in your hand. So how much is the tithe? $100, right. Very simple, okay. But which, you have 10 $100 bills. Which one is the tithe? We say the first one, yes, because you're listening to the message. Way to go, great, okay. But how do you know which one? Okay, here it is. I'm gonna help you. It's the first one that leaves your hand. That's the tithe. In other words, if you go home and you say, let me set aside some for the house, some for the clothes, some for food, some for uh, vehicles and fuel and vacation, things like this, and here's what's left over for God. Okay, that's not the tithe. You actually gave the tithe 
somewhere else. And as I said a moment ago, if you gave it to the rent or the mortgage company, the mortgage company does not have the power to bless the other nine. See, 90% with God's blessing goes farther than 100% without God's blessing. And it doesn't make any sense at all in your mind. But a whole lot of things in this book don't make any sense in your mind. All right, so let me just close with this. I, start, I stopped at Exodus 13, verse 12. I mean, verse 13. Let me, let me start at verse 14 now. Verse 14 says, so it shall be obeyed. Oh, by the way, no, I want to tell you one thing before this. I am not legalistic about this because God, it's, it's a matter of the heart, okay? So if you say, well, I've been tithing for years, but I didn't know that. It's okay. That's okay. But now you know it, so it's not okay anymore, okay? All right. But the first thing, here's the way it works for me. I give online. Giving online, Pastor Joshua talked about that. I think that's the best way to give. So, but when I, on the day, I get paid the 15th and the 30th, and it's, it's automatic deposit. So it magically appears in my account, okay? On those days during my quiet time, during my quiet time, I go online and I send the tithe. Or some people say, I just set it up where on those days it goes out first because I might forget. That's fine. Um, there's nothing wrong with that at all either, okay? But let's just say that I get busy and I have my quiet time and it's kind of quick and I then have to go to some meetings and I come home that night and I think, oh, it's 15th, I got paid today. I, and I forgot to tithe. And let's just say I go online and I notice that my wife has gone to the grocery store first. I don't say to her, oh, that's great, sugar, we're cursed. <laughs> because it's the heart. The first that I do comes is the tithe. So don't get, I'm not talking about something legalistic. I'm just talking about in your heart is God first. That's all I'm talking about, okay? In your heart. All right. All right. So Exodus 4, 13, verse 14. So it shall be when your son asks you in time to come, saying, what is this? This is killing the firstborn or sacrificing the firstborn. That you shall say to him, by strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And it came to pass when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go, that the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all males that open the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. Okay, here's what God is saying. He's saying, one day your son's going to come and ask you, why do you do this? And I want to, and you, here's what you tell him. So just think about this, all right? The son runs into the kitchen and he says, mom, dad, guess what? The sheep just had a baby lamb. Just, just now, it's her first lamb, just that lamb. So the whole family gets up, goes out to the barn, and the father grabs the butcher knife on the way. And there's this little sheep, little lamb, and it stands up, and everyone says, oh, look, he's standing up. He's standing up. And then the father grabs the lamb by the back legs, cuts its throat, and it bleeds out. And the son is sitting there watching this. Now, first of all, you know he's thinking, I don't know what he did, but I'm not going to do that. But as time goes on, he starts to wonder, why do you do this? Then he goes to college, comes back, and his dad says, why don't you take over the books? You took accounting. Why don't you take over the books? And so one day he calls his dad in. He says, Dad, listen, come on. I need to, I've been going over the books, and I need to ask you a question. Um, dad, um, every time that one of our animals has a firstborn, um, um, I, I, I don't know how I should say this, but um, you... You, you kill it. And um, you, you don't have that knife with you right now, do you? I just would just check it. Okay. All right. Uh, but, Dad, we, we lost 87 animals last year. And this is cutting into our profits. So I just need to know, why, why, why do you do this? He said, your son's going to ask you one day why you do this. And he said, this is what you tell him. You, need, you say, son, 
There's something about our family that you don't know. We didn't used to be ranchers. We had no sheep. As a matter of fact, we were enslaved people. But God, with a mighty hand, delivered us and gave us everything that you see today. Therefore, I gladly give the firstborn to God. Okay, so one day I'm doing the tithe. Now this was years ago before we did online and I would write out the check. So I was paying the bills, but the first check that I would write would be the tithe check. And I would write it out and then I would set it over to the side, just set it over to the side like this, and then I'd pay all the bills. Next. And my son with the math mind, he comes in and he's like eight or nine years old, but he's, he's got a brilliant math mind and he looks at the tithe check and he says to me, Dad, why are you giving so much money to the church? And I remembered this scripture. <laughs> and so I took my son and I set him on my lap and I said to him, son, there's something about your daddy that you don't know. But your daddy wasn't always a Christian. And your daddy used to be a very, very bad man. And your daddy couldn't stop being a bad man. But God, with a mighty hand, rescued your daddy. Therefore, I gladly give to God the first of all that we have. Gladly. You see, when this becomes a principle in your heart, it's not a duty anymore. It's a love relationship between you and the one who saved you. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want you to just take a moment and just ask the Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me through this message? And with your eyes closed, I just want to answer a question that I think some of you have. Some of you might be thinking, Pastor Robert, I want to tithe. I want to. But I can't afford to tithe. Please let me explain something to you. You will never be able to afford to tithe until you tithe. Because according to Scripture, we live in a cursed world. And the tithe is what redeems us out from under the curse. So I just want to know what's God speaking to you. And I want you just to make a commitment to God today to just simply say, God, by your grace, I'm going to put you first in my life. First is my Lord and my Savior. First in my family, my marriage, my job and my finances. And when I put you first in my finances, according to scripture, my heart will follow. And then I just want to pray for you and then turn it back to Pastor Joshua. Lord, I want to tell you, thank you, thank you, thank you, that you gave us this principle, not for your good, but for our good. And I pray that you will do something in our hearts today that this will be life to us and not law. It will be life to put you first in every area of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Robert. I want everyone watching this Redemption Greenstone, Redemption Netherlands. We're not ending right now. I want you to stay with us. 
I want to say a few things. God wants you living in freedom and victory, not in slavery and bondage. Many of you in this room and other rooms are living in slavery even though you have money, even though you have resource. You're living defeated and broken. Many of you don't have resource, and that's obvious. But in a time like now, You've been asking God to help. You've been complaining about environments. You've been complaining about economies. God sent someone here with an anointing to teach you how to transition from slavery into freedom, from bondage into what God has for you. And I want to encourage you to hear the Holy Spirit today because you are going to be a testimony that God is walking with you in a time like this, in a world like now, in an economy like we face. And it's going to be a testimony to your children and your children's children. Amen. I asked myself this question because Pastor Robert paid his own trip. He's come out here to bless us. He's paid all his expenses. How can we bless him? And I want every single person watching right now to stretch your hands out. Those of you in this room, stretch your hands out to the stage. Those of you watching online, Redemption Greenstone, Netherlands, we're going to pray for Pastor Robert, his family, their church, because they're in transition. And I can tell you this, the devil hates transition. The devil hates when generation to generation pursue the call of God. The generation hates when the church sees beyond itself into the future. And what we can do is we can pray all around the world. Redemption Netherlands, join in with us. Father, we lift up Pastor Robert, Debbie, their family, their church. Today, Lord Jesus, we declare over their home, God is in the story. God has done such a mighty work in that family and in that church to this point. But today we declare God has a great plan for the future. We speak health, wholeness, divine protection, divine wisdom. God, you walk with them in such a way that whatever attack the enemy launches and prepares and plans and strategizes will not come to pass. Every single weapon formed shall not prosper. Their church will declare that they have a generational God. And I thank you for Pastor Robert, for him as he does this, Lord God. Give him all strength, all wisdom, all health, all wholeness. Father, I thank you for the next generation as James is stepping in, Lord God. Give him wisdom to walk with his dad and the leadership and that church. Lord Jesus, that it will go from glory to glory. In their family, they will go from strength to strength. And both ministries, father and son, will shine brighter than ever before as they walk together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Redemption, Greenstone and Netherlands, you can take over.